Hello, thank you for joining this session. My name is Missy Harriman and I'm in the Agency Services Department here at the Greater Cleveland Food Bank. I am very excited to introduce you to Amy Medan. Uh, Amy is a licensed professional clinical counselor with over 13 years of experience in mental health fields. She has extensive training and experience in working with clients that have experienced trauma, complex trauma, and vicarious trauma. She is trained in several therapeutic approaches that specialize in the treatment of trauma, including TF-CBT and AF-CBT, which focus on understanding the symptoms of PTSD, understanding how a client's behaviors are a function of the client's past traumas and how to build relationships with those that have been traumatized. Wanting to expand her clinical skill set, she accepted a position at Ease at Work in 2016. She worked for three years as the clinical coordinator before transitioning to her current role as the EAP clinical services manager. In this role, she oversees all clinical aspects of Ease at Work, in addition to providing direct services to clients, supervising the clinical staff, developing and providing trainings, and leading CR CIRs as needed. Her passion for working with clients with trauma has recently created opportunities to work with local police and first responders in, in providing support and education surrounding the vicarious trauma that they are exposed to in their careers. Welcome, Amy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me, Missy. I'm very happy to be here. Um, as me, Missy introduced myself, my name is Annie Medan, and I am going to spend some time today talking with you about trauma-informed care. There we go. Okay, so Missy did um, just an overview about just a little bit of my history and background. And I wanted to just talk a little bit more about me. So when I worked um, in Beach Book, which is a large mental health agency in Cleveland, um, I worked primarily as a residential therapist, an outpatient therapist, working with children, adolescents, and families. Um, most, if not all, had experienced either physical or sexual trauma um, and abuse throughout their lifespan. One of the models that Missy explained was um, AFCBT, and what that is is Alternatives for Families Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. So once upon a time, um, I was the only clinician trained in Cuyahoga County on um, this model, and any child abuse case that came through Cuyahoga County that was substantiated also came through my therapy office, and I had the opportunity to work with families and help work through the traumas that they had experienced at home um, and help with reunification. So um, that's just a little bit about me. I then um, transitioned about five years ago over to the EAP world, um, incredibly different than trauma-based worlds. Um, I hold trauma as a very close place to my heart. I gained a lot of experience um, as a counselor in this area. Oops, sorry. Okay, so when I was a trauma-based therapist, um, working with individuals who have trauma, I want to say I had the opportunity to be threatened by a client who was um, dealing with and processing traumas at the time. And so most people would be like, "How? why do you see this as an opportunity? Is that I saw this as an opportunity as a clinician to be able to grow, to understand, to open my curiosity instead of placing judgment on why somebody was attacking me or threatening me. Um, it provided a lot of really great opportunities for growth as a clinician and really to understand um, how trauma affects not just me, but each and every one of us. So talking about, um, did I miss a slide? Nope. So defining trauma, when we think about trauma, um, as it's defined, we say that trauma can result from an, one exposure or a series of ex exposures in which it really shatters our sense of security. So if each of us can think about a time in which we consider ourselves maybe traumatized or an incident in which we were really truly afraid. So an example, a lot of times people think traumas have to be really big and really significant. And the truth is they don't. We're each affected very, very differently. So trauma that I share with myself is I had um, a 110 pound lab 
who had a grand mole seizure when I was home alone with my infant son. And I came downstairs and his large body was bouncing all over the place. He was foaming at the mouth. Um, he sort of snapped at me, the most docile dog. And that moment was completely traumatizing to me. Um, my world was sort of shattered. I was feeling very insecure. I had an infant upstairs. I had this big dog. I didn't know what to do with. So a lot of individuals would say like, what is so traumatic about that? To me and my um, life, that moment in time definitely caused some acute trauma for me. So what we know is that trauma uh, really affects somebody's functioning, their mental health, their physical, their social, and their emotional and spiritual well-being. So really just keeping in mind that trauma can be a wide variety of circumstances and they can affect everybody differently. So some other experiences or general experiences that uh, may be traumatic can, like I said, physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. So somebody doesn't have to have somebody physically harming them. Words can harm somebody and that can cause um, an experience, a traumatic experience for them. Childhood neglect. So we know that when children are developing, that's when our brains are developing the most. Um, there's actually a correlation with the release of serotonin um, in an infant's brain right around six months. And so we know that if a child is neglected at that stage of life, that they really have a hard time um, with attachment and that their brain is sort of wired differently because they didn't have that nurturing caregiving. Living with a family member with either mental health and or substance abuse disorder. So if you have a caregiver who is struggling with depression, they're not able to get out of bed. They are really, you know, uh, not able to care for you and do different things. Um, we know that that can cause traumatic events. Dealing with somebody, a caregiver, or living with somebody with substance abuse, maybe the erratic behaviors, unpredictable behaviors, that can absolutely um, create some trauma in our lives and, and our ability to build relationships with others. Sudden unexplained separation from loved one, maybe the sudden death, maybe somebody uh, going to jail or just disappearing out of your life without really knowing um, is absolutely another traumatic experience. Poverty, not having our basic needs met, really struggling, are we struggling for food, are we struggling for shelter, um, things that make us feel grounded in foundation, racism, discrimination, and oppressive, um, being in a, an oppressed group, absolutely contribute, whether it is um, overt or subtle, they absolutely can create trauma um, in our development and how we function. Violence within the community, if we're living in the inner city and we are surrounded by gangs and violence, or you are um, in an area which there's war or terrorism. So we know that these events can either be ongoing and relentless stress, they can be a one-time event, but they all absolutely are experiences uh, that can be traumatic. So although we know that um, life circumstances create trauma for us, um, and a lot of trauma occurs different ages, but we know that if trauma occurs in an early age, that it really affects um, our brain development. So there's a study called Adverse Childhood Experiences, and that's the ACEs. I refer to that um, periodically throughout this. And what we know is that these are common across all sectors of society. And an individual who has one ACE, so one adverse childhood experience, 62% of adults with just one or 62% of adults have experienced just one um, adverse childhood experience. And so we know that trauma higher than 50% of our population. 25% um, with three or more ACEs, so three or more adverse childhood experiences that lead to trauma, 25% of all of us have experienced that. So if you think about your group of friends, your coworkers, 25%, one in four of you have experienced um, three or more, and more than half of you have experienced one or more. Uh, 
this ACE assessment, it's 10 questions. So three or more of those questions. Um, if you answer yes to three or more of those questions out of 10. So that sort of gives you a perspective as to really how common um, traumatic experiences are. So health impacts. So when we're talking, referring to this ACE study again, um, what we know is that an individual, so an adult um, with any sort of ACE score is that they are two times more likely to smoke than somebody who does not have any. Four times more likely to have COPD, so a lung issue. 10 times, 10 times more likely to have injected street drugs. Two and a half times more likely to have sexually transmitted infections. So we know that they are having risky, unprotected sex. Seven times more likely to consider themselves alcoholics and 12 times more likely to have attempted suicide. So what that tells us is that individuals who have experienced trauma don't tend to cope very well, and they tend to gravitate towards maladaptive coping skills, ones that provide in the moment's relief, but not long-term and tend to create more struggles in life. So we ask, what is the relationship between trauma and health risk behaviors? So sort of what I just briefly touched on is maladaptive behaviors, is that when we are in a traumatic environment, we and we as a child or we are experiencing something is that we look for instant gratification, instant relief to let go of whatever we're struggling with. And when we look at maladaptive behaviors, it could be we talk about unhealthy eating. So that's emotional eating. My something like my boyfriend broke up with me and there's sort of like this cliche statement that okay, my girlfriend's going to bring over some ice cream and we're going to sit and just pound away on ice cream in that moment. Okay. But if it extends past that, that becomes emotional, unhealthy eating. Tobacco use, smoking, um, vape pets, e-cigarettes, anything that contains nicotine also gives you a, an instantaneous moments of relief and stress relief, but we know that that leads to long-term health problems. Alcohol and drug use. Is social drinking acceptable? Using it when to numb any behaviors or anything that you are struggling with, we know that long-term creates a lot of long-term problems for us. Leads to job loss, family loss, sometimes hitting the bottom of the road and ending up in treatment. Increased sexual activity. So the connection with this is really the idea and the premise of being able to feel connected to another human in a nurturing way in the moment. So individuals who experience trauma tend to seek out these risky sexual activity behaviors for the premise and idea of being connected to another human. And when we engage in risky sex sexual behaviors, sexual transmitted diseases, unwanted pregnancies, those things tend to occur and um, exasperate themselves. So we ask, what is the impact of trauma on our relationships? And so we know that when an individual has experienced a traumatic event, specifically that, uh, that involves another individual or a caregiver, is that it leads to feelings of feeling unsafe. And these relationships uh, aren't just within people, they're also in with communities. If we have been traumatized um, due to racism or poverty or oppression, we then don't trust our community. It really changes our, our viewpoint of the world. And then we tend to not trust delivery systems, delivery systems of healthcare. There's reasons that our populations don't trust the healthcare system. And that goes back intergenerationally for many, many years. And so when a person who experiences trauma, they feel unsafe, they feel betrayed, and so therefore they are trusting others. And that impacts our ability to build positive strength-based relationships. We also tend to have feelings of anger and aggression. We tend to feel shame, maybe some numbness um, and isolation because we feel responsible. We can feel responsible for the traumas that we have experienced.
So we say, can the effects of trauma be avoided or addressed? So that's a great question. So what we know is that we have protective factors built into us. And those protective factors are things like supporting relationships. So for children, for adults, it's for children, it could be um, a teacher at school, a, some, a, a coach, a youth, a youth coach, anybody that they can run into that they can learn to trust others. Sometimes family members are unpredictable and it becomes, it creates an additional insecurity. So being able to be a family member that can be supportive and be open and willing with active listening skills to provide and teach um, an individual how to build a supportive relationship. So trauma-informed um, approaches, trauma-informed care, an, organization, an organizational method to how we approach and talk to individuals, being aware of what each person brings to the table, what each and everyone's story is, being able to be open and supportive in that when we're dealing with anybody. Therapeutic conventions, uh, interventions, like I said, that alternatives for families, really being able to work with not only the parent who um, instigated the aggressive behavior and was the abuser, but also the child to help them understand right from wrong, to help them learn and understand the appropriate nurturing relationships and supportive relationships so they don't continue to carry that on with their children to help break that cycle. Um, Trauma-focused CBT is really a therapeutic approach that really works on helping the individual process their narrative. And what I mean by that is if they've had one or a series of traumatic events, helping them work through that, writing about that, talking about their feelings that are connected to that, um, helping them process that they don't have to feel own ownership of what happened to them. They don't have to feel shame. They don't have to feel isolation so that they don't head towards those maladaptive coping skills. Also, relational healing is a great um, trauma-specific treatment. And that is, again, really about building relationships. So if you can hear anything um, that I'm talking about, relationships with supports and being able to provide comfort and safety to those is a large part of um, trauma-informed and trauma-informed care. It really helps individuals to begin to process their past traumas, their current traumas, um, in a much healthier way. So what does experiencing childhood trauma mean for adults? So what we know is that when an individual as a child experiences an isolated trauma or a series of trauma, um, traumatic events, is that our brains are wired differently. They, their synapses connect differently to, from those in an individual who has not experienced any trauma in life. And so that happens as, um, as a result of repeated stress, an ability to self-regulate, an ability to feel calm, an ability to feel secure. So when that happens, then as we grow um, from childhood to adolescence to adulthood, is we really struggle to learn how to respond appropriately because we are constantly um, on defense, on guard, and not sure how we are going to engage with others and our trusting factor of other humans in our life is questionable. We're just not really quite sure how to trust. So when we're not sure how to trust individuals, then we really don't ever learn how to respond appropriately to any situation. We tend to um, misjudge, have a very narrow point, um, viewpoint of different scenarios where somebody who hadn't experienced as much trauma might look at something completely different. What we have then too um, from childhood traumas is that an increase in mental health disorders. So if you think about a time in which you were incredibly um, stressed or dysregulated and you were experiencing either some depression or some anxiety, is that you understand how those incidences in your current situation can lead to those mental health problems. If you imagine those being exasperated by childhood traumas year after year, um, you can understand how anxiety, depression, aside from PTSD, can really exasperate themselves into adulthood. 
it just sort of manifests itself and builds on itself year after year um, and incident after incident because our worldview changes our ability to trust decreases and decreases and increases uh, our isolation from one another those then uh, go into maintaining, um, we really have trouble maintaining healthy relationships. We don't know how to trust. We don't um, feel good about ourselves. We don't have any self-worth. And that then turns into um, our inability to continue to, or even develop healthy relationships. So you say we've talked about um, understanding trauma and what that means. So say, what is trauma-informed care? So. Trauma-informed care actually um, was developed to work with children, children um, in foster care, children who had experienced childhood events so that they could learn to feel safe, um, build connections with others, and really help them to develop healthy coping skills so they weren't heading down the path of um, maladaptive coping skills. It then, since then, has really transitioned into an organizational framework that helps an organization to be able to recognize, understand, and respond to the effects of trauma. So you don't have to be a trauma expert in, or in order to be able to engage in um, and practice trauma-informed care. It really is about um, creating a safe space for trauma survivors, for addressing the effects of the trauma, and having a large organizational um, understanding of that to be able to work with our our coworkers, um, the people we care for, the people we work with, our employees, our customers. What is it not? So a lot of times, like I just said, is that the premise is that it is a clinical intervention. It is absolutely not a clinical intervention. You do not need to have a master's degree in social work or counseling. Um, it is really a way for all individuals in an organization to shift away from habitual routine procedures and traditional approaches, to really meet somebody where they're at, to understand possibly where they're coming from, and to be empathetic towards these things. It is also not a one-time implementation. So today I'm just discussing an overview of trauma-informed care. What are some things that we can do? But it really is an ongoing active response, an active way of living, an active way of engaging with others. And in order to do that, we have to be mindful of when we communicate with somebody, be, being super aware of what they're bringing to the table. And also equally importantly is what we are bringing to the table. What story do I have that might be triggered and might be responsive to somebody's behaviors towards me? Uh, again, so it is something that we can touch on now and start now, but then becomes an active part of everybody's um, everyday daily activities. So the challenges that are faced with uh, in dealing with individuals who have experienced trauma. So we understand that it really is a wide pack and um, has a widespread impact. And it's not just for yourself, but it's for those you serve, for your staff and for your organization. So for many years, there was a large misconception that trauma was abnormal. And that if you um, had a traumatic experience that you were like one in a million. And we now know that that is not all the case. So as I said earlier, um, is that 62% of adults have experienced one or more um, ACE or um, adverse childhood experience. And we are also finding that over 70% of adults have experienced some type of traumatic events outside of maybe in their childhood, maybe as an adulthood, but 70% um, is an incredible number. We also know that 90% of individuals receiving um, behavioral health services, therapy, um, case management, any sort of um, service like that, 90% of them have experienced a childhood or an adult traumatic event. So recognizing that for the people we serve is that trauma is very, very common. More times than not, an individual that you meet is going to have experienced a traumatic event as opposed to have not. So keeping in mind when you are dealing with customers um, and the people that you serve is that most likely the individual that you are encountering has experienced a traumatic event and their responses to you could be a direct result of that. For your staff, 
knowing that many of your staff probably have also experienced their own trauma and being sensitive to that when we are engaging with our staff, being understanding and empathetic towards those things. And when our staff is dealing with individuals who have been traumatized is that they themselves um, have an increased result of secondary trauma or vicarious trauma. And what that means is that experiencing and working with population who is traumatized, we then um, tend to become traumatized as response from these struggles and interactions and seeing um, individuals struggle in a traumatic experience, we then are affected as the staff. So being aware that your staff is carrying their own traumas and also can be experiencing some secondary or vicarious trauma, um, also known as compassion fatigue too, because of what they're experiencing in their jobs. Um, for your organization is that when there's a lot of stress is that we know that it increases burnout, increases our um, compassion fatigue, and that then um, ends up having negative organizational effects. Um, absenteeism, less productivity, um, higher turnover rates, or your team morale is really decreased. So being aware of these pieces um, with trauma in your organization and facing them, how increasing your awareness can go a long way in moving forward with the trauma-informed care. So we ask, what's the solution? How can we work forward on um, building a trauma-informed organization? And so the solution really is implementing an organizational change is that the entire organization, everybody that you work with begins to be mindful of their story and the stories of those that they serve. So um, it requires honestly really strong leadership, initial and ongoing training and development, really understanding how your each unique organization can impact and you can be impacted. Um, clear communication. So that way everybody is on the same page that they can understand um, why we're using the language we're using, why we're responding the way that we're responding. Um, increasing individuals knowledge of trauma and traumatic experiences. And in addition to that, how people and why people respond the way that we do, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so incorporating all of these things really creates a great foundation for change in order to implement um, a trauma informed care organization. So the three pillars of um, trauma-informed care are safety, connections, and coping. So starting with safety, and I've talked a lot about um, the effect of not having a safe environment, not having a safe person, not having um, the feeling of being safe in a system-wide organization or a community, healthcare services, not being able to trust um, that in order for recovery to happen as adults, it is really important that we remember that we as um, the provider need to be reliable. We need to be available, um, predictable and honest. So we, I always say as a clinician is that I am not actually the expert, is that you, the person who walks in your shoes every day, you are a PhD in you. I am not, I help to help you organize, help you process things in a different and healthy way but you are your own expert. So allowing somebody to have that choice to feel safe, to feel confident in what they're doing, creating that um, really helps to build a pillar of uh, safety for trauma-informed care. Connections. So we know that individuals who have experienced trauma really struggle with the ability to connect in a healthy way. And when we are creating a safe environment. So when we're reliable, when we're available, when we're predictable, then in turns creates the ability and the opportunity for safety, for individuals to learn to trust us because they know what to expect from us. They know we're gonna be there. They know if they say something to us that can be super surprising, that we're not going to back away, that we're not gonna have a response, that we're really just gonna take it for what it is. Um, and that, and there's honestly a lot of times and when somebody is coming at you, in a way that is harsh or offensive because they trigger you and your ACEs, um, that it's hard to respond in a calm manner. 
So it's super important, again, for us to be aware of what we bring to the table, aware of our triggers and um, increased self-awareness. The coping. So coping skills is really the ability to manage our emotions. What does that look like for each of us? Allowing the person to label their feelings. It's not our place if somebody is coming at us for us to tell them that they're angry. That's their anger to own. And they may not be angry. They might actually be terrified. They might feel vulnerable and afraid. And so who are we to say that they're angry? It might look that way to us, um, but that's not how they're feeling. So giving them that space for them to learn to manage their emotions, giving them the opportunity to process their own experiences. Um, and we can do that by being reflective and active listening and supportive. Again, back to that space of being reliable um, and predictable. So you say, what can I do personally to be trauma-informed care? The first one is really to shift from judgments to curiosity. So instead of saying like, I know what, like what is going on with that person? Why are they acting that way? To say like, I wonder what's going on with them. I wonder what struggles they're having today. So somebody who spits fire at you or snaps at you, our typical instinct of response, impulsive response is to be like, that's ridiculous. Why are they acting that way? I don't have any time for that. But if we can shift our minds and we can say, you know what, like, I want to be here for them. They must really be struggling. So one of the things that most of us can identify with is sort of like road rage, right? Is that you're driving down the highway and somebody is swerving in and out, you know, and from your viewpoint is like almost causing accident after accident. And so when I'm in that situation, it happened on my way in today, I said to myself, gosh, I really hope that they aren't trying to get to somebody in the hospital or there, there wasn't any crisis in which they are frantically driving. And when I think about it that way and I take it from that position, I'm a lot less frustrated, you know, that I will step back, I have slowed down, I'd be aware of my surroundings, I will let this person go through. Um, as opposed to if I responded with like, gosh, like be careful, you know, and maybe give some gestures and some um, road rage language, some colorful language, that's going to change my mood too, right? So that is typically, um, that's a very easy one for most of us to identify with. So again, shifting from judgment to curiosity, learning. I want to hear your story. I want to hear what's going on with you. Again, we've talked a lot about offering safety and building trust with being predictable and reliable, uh, being patient, you know, sitting back. And if somebody's spitting fire at you, Again, check in with that curiosity. Why are they spitting fire at me? What is going on with them today? Instead of adding to their fire, what can I do to help offset this? How can I, um, moving on to the next one, how can I give them a voice in this situation? So if you think about a time in which you are overexhausted, you're tired, you're, you've worked a lot of hours, you're struggling, your kids are bad, you know, there's all sorts of things. Um, you then are feeling trapped, right? You're feeling backed into a corner and like a tiger backed into a corner, they're going to um, attack and reach out. If they're given the opportunity to escape um, and given choice and a, and a voice, it can really absolutely calm down the situation. It can de-escalate the situation just by asking a question like, hey, is there anything I can do for you? Let Tell me, how can I help you right now? It seems as though maybe you're a little, they're having a bad day. What's going on? How can I help you? So giving opportunity um, for people to have choices, let them have a voice. A lot of individuals who um, are traumatized have, didn't have that voice in that traumatic situation. And they were forced to do something. It was not their say, right? Nobody, most of us um, would not willingly engage in a traumatic situation. We were, this was forced upon us and we became the survivor of the victim of this trauma. Recognizing uh, the individual's strengths and building on the resi resiliency. So one thing that I like to say is that for somebody who, if I'm talking to somebody who is struggling, is that you have gotten through 100% of the tough things that you have ever gone through in life. And if you hadn't gotten through those, you wouldn't be standing right here right now. So I want you to reflect on that, is that I see that you're having a rough day, but let's talk about the things that you're good at. Let's talk about the strength. Let's talk about your resiliency. How did you get through that tough time? 
What did you do before? The, what worked for you? What didn't work for you? If it didn't work for you, let's not even entertain it, but let's build on the strengths and resiliency that you had through any sort of traumatic or troubled experience getting through there. And these are conversations that you can have with anybody, truthfully, anybody that you see is struggling and having a hard time. Um, we know that we like to be built up. When people build us up and we build ourselves up, we feel better about ourselves. And a lot of times individuals who have experienced trauma in life don't haven't had that opportunity. They haven't had the ability to have relationships with individuals that build them up. A lot of times they're knocked down and they don't feel good about themselves. So there's not a lot of self-worth in there. Contributing to an individual's self-worth and self-esteem can go a long way um, in building those relationships and being trauma-informed. So again, um, how can I be personally trauma-informed? So uh, the ACE assessment, which is what I refer to um, way early on in a bunch of different times is that uh, taking that, understanding your triggers, understanding if somebody comes at you and they remind you a lot of you at that age, or they remind you of similar situations in which you have gone through. Increasing that self-awareness so that way you are aware of what triggers you, of what gets underneath your skin, of how you are going to respond. So if we are aware of our situations and our triggers and our traumas, and we can be responsive to how we respond to ourselves and controlling ourselves, we can be much more open and available to be um, trauma-informed and to care for individuals that are trauma-informed. Uh, the ACE assessment, um, there's a link there. I'm not sure if you're going to be getting uh, the PowerPoint to the link, but an ACE assessment is free. It is online. There's a bunch of different versions. They all uh, have pretty much the same questions. They get to the same thing and it's self-scoring. So I encourage you, uh, if you are working on improving your ability to be trauma-informed and to work on uh, different aspects to help you, is to take this test. It, grab, um, learn some things about you, increase your self-awareness, um, see what you bring to the table. So every single person has a story, each and every one of us. I have my story. My story is different than your story. Even if you have siblings, each of your stories um, growing up is very different than somebody else's. If we experience a traumatic event with a group of people, my story and your story and your story are all very different because we are sitting in our shoes that stemmed from our past viewpoints, our experiences in life. So it's really important to be able to be aware and um, so that way you can respond appropriately. So engaging daily in trauma-informed care, whether this is at home, at work, at the grocery store, you know, um, taking your children to swimming lessons, going to swimming lessons yourself, um, engaging in this is really being aware of the prevalence of trauma and how common it is for all individuals. So we said it is more, it is more uncommon to not have experienced a traumatic event in life than it is to have experienced one or more of them. Having recognition of the traumatic impact and how those survival stances of fight, flight, or freeze may show up in the people we serve, um, the people we support, the people closest to us, um, or the people we work with. So really engaging and being having an awareness and a recognition of what those things look like. Uh, again, engaging in steps to avoid re-traumatizing re somebody while supporting them. So if somebody snaps at us and we snap back at them, we're re reinforcing their data that, see, people are unpredictable, um, that they're not trustworthy, they're not compassionate. And we want to do our best to sort of work on counteracting what individuals see as people and relationships. We want to help to build positive relationships and healthy relationships with individuals. Trauma-informed language. So this absolutely takes some practice because under the don't say column is things that we that pop into our head that are instinct, instinctful. And we really have to be mindful in changing 
our language from the don't say to the say instead. Um, and this absolutely takes practice. I encourage you to practice it in a time in which is not high stress. So if you're having a conversation with a friend or a spouse or a caregiver, your children, um, try and practice these things. So for example, don't say, oh my gosh, that's so awful. I don't believe it, right? So that is like what they're saying to you is this big shock value. And so then when somebody, if you share something with somebody and they're shocked, you are a little bit more hesitant next time to be so open, right? Because it makes you feel ashamed and, um, and not okay with what happened. But if you can say, you know what, I believe you and this isn't your fault, that really helps to open up and create a warmth and inviting conversation to have. Somebody is not going to be as easy to retract and not want to engage with you again if they feel as though they didn't shock you. Um, so when I first started doing counseling, um, a lot of what I heard shocked me um, as I developed. And so I had to be incredibly aware of my facial expressions, sitting in sessions with um, defiant male teens. And in my brain, I was very aware to make sure that I had a, the flattest face that I could. And as years of experience happened is that truthfully now nothing does shock me, but as I learned and I grew with that is really being mindful to my body language and how I was responding to somebody else. So not just the words that came out of my mouth, but my facial expressions, my body language. Somebody says something to me and I have this like big startled response. I don't have to say I believe you, it's not your fault. My body language is going to say at all, even if I say absolutely nothing coming out of my mouth. Uh, so on to the next one. You don't have to do that anymore. That makes it sound like it was their choice to want to do that, right? Like I said, people don't aren't willingly choosing to put themselves in traumatic situations. When stating like what happened to you is not your fault. I can empathize. We can't understand unless we have been in their shoes and we all know that we can't be in their shoes because we are in our own shoes. But I can imagine how difficult that was or I can't imagine how difficult that was. Being honest and open. People um, who have experienced traumas, they can read you. They can know whether or not you are being truthful and you are being responsive or if you're just spitting words at them. So be true to you. If you can, if you haven't experienced someone that I can imagine what that is like, or if you have no idea whatsoever, saying, I, I can't imagine, that had to have been incredibly awful. Um, don't say, I feel so sorry for you. Like, that's so awful. Individuals who have been traumatized, they don't want a pathetic response. They don't want to feel like a victim. They want to be a survivor. They want to feel heard, but they don't want self-pity. That's not someplace they have survived all of these things. They've gone through all of these things and they absolutely want to feel strong and they want to feel heard and they want to feel validated. So letting them know that whatever you're feeling is okay. So we encourage you feel whatever feeling. If you're feeling angry one minute, if you're feeling sad the next minute, if you're feeling happy the next minute, all of those are fine. We encourage you to feel all of those. Having feelings is so much better than not having any feelings at all and being numb. Because honestly, how you're feeling is right in the moment, is that nobody, again, can tell you what is right and what is wrong. Those are your feelings, own them and feel proud about them and allowing them to know that you feel that for them and that you want them to have those feelings. So recognizing a trauma response. So we have heard, all of us have heard the fight, um, flight or freeze response. So when somebody is um, experiencing a trauma or being re-traumatized or just in their viewpoint and world, how they respond is one way is that they can fight. So that is, can be verbally snapping at somebody, uh, being physically aggressive. You know, those dukes up, I'm ready to go, people. Um, that's one way. So we know when somebody's ready to fight and they you know, come at you, guns ablaze in, whether they're yelling at you or they're posturing or they're walking up to you. Um, that's one way to recognize a trauma response. So in that moment, you step back and you say to yourself, okay, I'm not passing judgment. I'm curious, what is going on with this person? 
And being in that place when you are feeling maybe a little bit threatened because that's bringing up some stuff for you can be incredibly challenging. So being aware, which is why it's so important to be self-aware, maybe stepping back from a little bit, relaxing your body, um, giving yourself calm, placing both of your feet on the ground, being aware of your physical space can help you to respond. Flight, right? That's when somebody is like, I'm out of here is that they're gonna bolt, they're gonna run for the doors. They aren't saying anything, they're shutting down. And that point, you're sort of, you may not feel as threatened, but you might be like, what is going on? And you want to encourage that person, but being responsive to letting them feel that and understanding um, what that is. So a great example would be a child called up to a classroom to um, report on an essay that he had just gotten an A on, but he is incredibly terrified to be in front of a group of people. And he's like, I'm out not doing this, the teacher's like, I don't understand. Like you had such a great essay. I want you to share it with your class. And the student's like, absolutely not. Maybe the other kids in the class have picked on him during lunch or uh, are bullying him outside of school, putting himself in that position, make him feel incredibly invulnerable. But you would say to yourself, if you were being judgment, it would be like, he had an A, why would he not want to? If you're curious, you would say to yourself like, okay, I wonder what's going on. You'd meet him say like, don't worry about it. You don't have to do that freeze. So that's the startled response is, uh, for example, an example would be like a colleague going out to coffee, um, two co-workers, and all of a sudden the fire alarm goes off in the coffee shop and your co-worker just sort of freezes and is kind of like the deer in headlights and doesn't move. And you're like, whoa, you know, like, let's go, let's go. And he can't move. Maybe he had a childhood, um, was in the house fire or in um, wildfire or in a fire and work, and he was just startled and scared and not knowing what to do. So really being aware of those three types of responses are the typical responses. People are either gonna fight, put their dupes up and be ready to come at you, or they're going to say, out, I'm done, I have nothing to do with this, I'm not even engaging, or they're just gonna freeze. So being able to be aware of those so that you can be responsive, curious, validating what's going on in the pay, like, is there anything that I can do for you? What do you need from me? Um, what do you need to feel safe? And a lot of times they may not have an idea, but being able to present yourself in that way as somebody who is caring and aware um, of what they possibly might be going on, that is sort of the premise of being, about being trauma-informed and being able to care for somebody in a way that you respect where they're at and recognize what's going on with them as well. Um, so like I said, sort of at the beginning in my um, last slide to sort of summarize everything up is that trauma-informed care is not a clinical intervention. Um, it absolutely can be a, a treatment approach, but it is not. It's something that we all can engage in and participate in um, every day at home, at work, uh, professional, personal. And um, we can... Uh, make sure that we include the people we serve, our staff members, elevate it to an organizational level. Um, and it really is about being aware of individuals and all the trauma. We can't be possibly aware of every trauma that anybody has experienced, but we absolutely can be aware that trauma is prevalent and that what we bring to the table and other people bring to the table, um, being mindful and aware and how we respond and engage with individuals can go a long way um, in supporting all of the people that we work with. Thank you so much, Amy. That was amazing. Um, I know that this presentation is very important for our partners in the community um, who face these kind of challenges. And so thank you so much for speaking to everybody. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, I encourage everyone who is watching from home to please ask questions in the chat box. We'll be happy to ask those to Amy. Um, but our first question is, are there certain common triggers a person has experienced trauma will have? So I think common triggers um, can be tricky because each of us has our own story. So when we think about, so my triggers might be different than your triggers, even if we experience the same trauma. So really being aware of if an example, so if somebody is coming at us and they're spatting off words at us and they're firing words, 
Um, and we were raised in an emotionally abusive relationship or we had an emotionally abusive spouse and they're firing at us. That could absolutely trigger some things in us and I might respond to differently than you might respond. So being aware that sort of in the fight, flight or freeze mode is that recognizing if somebody responds in a big way um, or even a little bit way that just doesn't sit right with you. So being aware of those and that's why our own self-awareness is so incredibly important. What can our volunteers and staff do to make sure we aren't setting off triggers for our clients who may have experienced trauma? Right. So I think the number one thing, honestly, um, is to come from a place of curiosity and not judgment. If somebody is responding um, in a heightened way in any fashion, whether it's tears or anger or really shutting down, um, is ask them what's going on. Ask them how you can help them. How can I be of service to you? What can I do for you? You know, and if they say, I don't know, I just need time, say, I'm happy to give you that time. You take your time, whatever you need to do, and I will be back here waiting to not continue to push ourselves and help them engage with us. I love that phrase. How can I be of service to you? Uh, what kind of advice do you have for volunteers at our food pantries or other hunger relief programs who may come in contact with an individual who may be hostile? So if the approach of what can I do for you? I see that you're struggling. I want to be here for you. Let me know what you're doing. Um, if that doesn't work, really being mindful yourself to remember that when they're hostile, it really has nothing to do with you. Is that you just happen to be the person at the receiving end of that and their anger is really about what's going on with them. What happened five minutes before they got there? What happened 20 minutes before they got there? So doing yourself to a favor to yourself to really sort of detach from that environment so that way we can separate it and it doesn't rise up feelings for us. Um, and how can our partners access the information about the ACE assessment? I believe we did put the link in the chat box. Great. So that is um, the assessment in the link in the chat box is one, uh, one version of the ACE that I just like and am uh, most familiar with. You can Google search ACE assessments, PDF and Tons of them come up. Um, there isn't one that's more better than the other. Um, the one that I put in the link is just more concise, um, 10 questions and is easy to follow. Great. And um, how can trauma-informed care combat compassion fatigue? Sure. So when we are um, trauma-informed care and we are aware of how we respond to others, how we engage with others, is that that allows us to not take on these things ourselves. So when we work with individuals that are really struggling and they come in and somebody's hostile towards us and uh, we're working in an environment in which we're really out there wanting to help people so we know that they're in a place of struggling and suffering is that you know planting, knowing that we are doing good for them. And one, I always say like I'm planting one seed and if it's one interaction with me is the only positive interaction that they have in that day, then it's more than they would have had if, had they not interacted with me. So really being um, open, non-judgmental, empathetic, validating somebody's feelings, it helps us to feel good. Um, and then we also, if we go with the mindset of like, I'm doing good for one person, one, you know, just for once a day. And uh, how can organizations prepare to encounter a community member that might be ex ex um, exhibiting trauma? So I think by, um, really encouraging ongoing discussion about how we can be trauma-informed, what we can do uh, on a daily basis to be aware of these different things that are happening within our organization and with the people we serve. And the more awareness we have, um, the better we'll be able to have ongoing discussions so that way people continue to learn and grow. So the more educated we are about this topic, the more we can um, practice it, the more we can be engaged in it. And the more we do that, the more it becomes second nature to us. And, um, and then we can you know, continue to pass it on and on, sort of like the ripple effect. So uh, a lot of times at our programs, um, our program contacts become very close to the uh, people that they are serving. And if the person who they are serving comes up to them and says, I'm having some really hard time with trauma right now, I'm dealing with a really difficult situation. Is there any community resources that you suggest that you could, that they could pass that information along to them? Sure, absolutely. So 211 is mobile crisis um, and anybody can call that at any time. 
and get, um, well, they will come to you and provide services. So there's a lot of, um, the Centers for Families and Children has um, another great resources for um, individuals who are on Medicaid. And really in that moment, sometimes somebody who's experiencing trauma, if they have that relationship with you and they're comfortable enough to say that to you, sometimes honestly just sitting with them, you know, and just letting them share their story and just truly listening and actively listening in a way that you aren't listening like in your back of your head like okay what do i need to do to give them services but just sitting with them and that energy that we um, expand or expel when we're sitting with somebody and actively listening to them um, can do wonders for somebody who is really struggling great all right, well, those were all the questions that I have. Um, if anybody has any questions after this session and you would like to reach out to us and ask, I can certainly forward those to Amy to see if she has any good um, tips and tricks for you as well. Um, but I wanna thank everyone for attending today's session. We look forward to seeing you at three o'clock for our next session. And we are very thankful to have you as a partner in the community.